This week on the Green Left News Podcast, 50 years since the brutal military coup in Chile, the fight to save koalas from logging, and the impact of Canada's deadly wildfires. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellis, and today I'm joined by refugee rights activist and Green Left journalist Chloe DS. Welcome. Hey, Isaac. Hey, listeners. Good to be here. So last week marked the 50th anniversary of the brutal military coup against Salvador Allende, the democratically elected socialist president of Chile in 1973. And September 11 marked the start of the Augusto Pinochet dictatorship, which ushered in a reign of terror in which tens of thousands were imprisoned tortured, exiled, disappeared, or murdered. The coup was backed by the US government through the CIA and also supported by Australia's Foreign Secret Service, or ASIS. The anniversary was marked by forums, exhibitions, and film screenings that were held in Gaddy or Sydney by community and Latin American solidarity groups, as well as a rally in Nam, Melbourne, which denounced the ongoing US interference in Latin America among countless other events across the country and around the world. Yeah, I went to the commemoration here in Melbourne at Trades Hall and it was uh, very, very powerful. Um, And meanwhile, Labor and the Coalition joined forces to block a Greens motion in the House of Representatives acknowledging Australia's role in the coup. The motion also called on the government to apologise to the people of Chile for the action of the ACES in supporting the coup and the harm caused by the dictatorship of General Pinochet. Redacted US national security documents show that the CIA requested Australia's aid in its activities in Chile shortly after Allende's election and Australia sent agents the following year. The full extent of Australia's activities in Chile are not clear because the coalition blocked the release of classified documents in 2021. But what is known is that the US and Australia targeted Allende's government because it refused to bow to the financial and military interests of the US empire. The Allende government nationalised Chile's copper mines and used that revenue to raise wages, expand healthcare and education and deliver free milk to children to address infant mortality and child poverty. Speaking to the motion, Greens MP Max chandler Mather said Allende's Chile represented an existential threat to the US power, stating that if a country could take ownership of its own resources and use that wealth for the benefit of many, if a country could forsake the interests of the US and flourish, then other countries might ask, why can't we do the same? Yeah, it's a really great point. So now we'll talk about what's happening around the country And uh, New South Wales Labor announced on September 12 that it would stop logging in high-value forests in the mid-north coast while it consults experts about its promised Great Koala National Park. But critics say that all logging must end in the designated area to have any chance of protecting koalas and important native forests. Labor Environment Minister Penny Sharp said logging had been stopped in 106 koala hubs which were identified as important habitat for koalas in 2017. These hubs cover about 5% of the 175,000 hectares of forest that are part of the proposed Great Koala National Park plan. But Labor has allowed logging to continue in multiple sites, including Moonpa, Orara East, Boambi, Newry State Forest and Yarrat State Forest. Green's environment spokesperson Sue Higginson said koalas will be extinct by 2050 if their habitat is not preserved, and for as long as Labor allows logging within the Great Koala National Park, it's breaking an election promise, Higginson said. About 200 farmers met for a conference at Glendon on August 26 to discuss protecting their black soil floodplain from coal seam gas mining. Speakers including soil and water experts, environmental lawyers, climate scientists and local land owners shared information about the devastation caused to soil, water and communities by coal and CSG extraction. Everyone agreed that the watering down of the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, which opened loopholes for new coal and CSG mines, 
needs to be closed and the act strengthened. Attendees signed a petition to halt CSG's mining until a solution is found for the safe disposal of the industry's toxic salt waste. Yeah, and in Gaddy on September 14, there was a protest against CSG mining, uh, which was attended by about 2,000 people, uh, including the Knitting Nanas, School Strike for Climate and other climate action groups. Uh, There's a lot of pressure on governments to stop CSG mining and the terrible impacts that it has on the environment. On the eve of the New South Wales budget, students from the Get A Room housing group and the New South Wales Greens rallied at Town Hall in Gaddy on September 9th, calling for an end to the demolition of public housing and for the introduction of rent controls. About 200 people marched through the CBD, highlighting the need for solutions to the housing crisis. Carolyn Lena, who was recently evicted from the 82 Wentworth Park Road public housing estate, which is set to be demolished, said New South Wales Labor must stick to its election promise to not demolish public housing. A reminder that the Housing Justice Summit, the coming together of housing action groups from across the country, is taking place on October 8th at the Gadi office of the Maritime Union of Australia and online via Zoom. You can find out more in the podcast description. A year and a half after sitting in Northern Territory Families Minister Kate Warden's office, closed Dondale activist Justin Tuddy has been found not guilty of trespass in Darwin's local court. The magistrate described Tuddy's action as an act of purported protest when Tuddy and other community members had demanded an emergency meeting with the minister after hearing about the reported self-harm crisis inside the Dondale Youth Detention Centre. November marks six years since the Royal Commission into the Detention and Protection of Children in the NT said that Don Dale was not fit for accommodating children and young people. Children as young as 10 have been detained in Don Dale, and figures from March show that there was more children detained than at any time in the past year. In August, the Northern Territory Labor government raised the age of criminal responsibility from 10 to 12, but the conditions inside Don Dale are not suitable for children of any age. Closed on Dale Now hold weekly vigils outside the centre every Friday at 5pm, so get involved. Queensland Labor is also guilty of locking up children in prisons and detention centres. And as we reported on last week, they have suspended the state's Human Rights Act to allow children to be indefinitely detained in adult watch houses. Socialist Alliance spokesperson and community lawyer Renee Lees told Green Left, the move is outrageous and without justification. Lees is running for Cairns Local Council in March next year and is campaigning against a proposed new youth prison in Cairns. She pointed out that most of the detained children have not been convicted of any crime. She told Green Left she has spent a lot of time in the Cairns Watch House representing kids and adults and the conditions are pretty terrible. She said it would be pretty frightening for a kid and a lot of talk about youth crime is often a euphemism for racism. Meanwhile, polling shows that the no vote in the voice referendum is rising. And as the vote approaches on October 14, Socialist Alliance National Co-Convener Sam Wainwright told Green Left that the party is advocating for a critical yes position. Wainwright said voting yes is the best of a bad choice and said both the official yes and no campaigns are based on conservative agendas. He said Socialist Alliance's position is based on what will put the country in the best position to fight for First Nations rights. Real substantial change is going to require grassroots movements for change. And they're going to need to spread across society uh, to to achieve land rights, implementation of the Royal um, Commission into Black Deaths in Custody uh, findings, bringing them home report, all those things, all the things that need to happen, all the real change that needs to happen is going to need to be pushed Meanwhile, Arente woman Celeste Little told Radio National on August 31st that since the date for the referendum was announced, the mainstream discussion has turned more racist. She said that rather than truth-telling, it has turned into an ugly discussion about First Nations people's worthiness. Little said she is still undecided on her vote 
but believes truth-telling should have come first and that putting truth-telling first would put First Nations people into a better position to fight for treaty and implement things like the voice. She said Albanese's message has been, we are giving them right, but we are not giving them real rights, which according to Little stems from Australia's lack of ability to reconcile with its past and its present as well as the ongoing legacy of colonisation and its impacts. The recently released intergenerational report 2023 revealed that spending on the NDIS healthcare, aged care, defence and interest payments will all continue to rise. Further, it revealed a greater percentage of tax revenue will come from income tax. In response, Teal Independent Allegra Spender called for the GST to be raised to reduce the reliance on income tax, but raising the GST would make it even harder for people being crushed by the cost of living crisis. Poor people spend a high percentage of their income on consumption, so raising the GST simply shifts the burden from the rich and onto low and middle income earners. A better solution would be to scrap the Stage 3 tax cuts, which will deprive the budget of a staggering $313 billion over 10 years. Combined with $368 billion over 30 years for nuclear submarines and the $10 billion a year for fossil fuel subsidies, there is plenty of money to, to pay for essential services like healthcare and NDIS. The money could also be used to massively expand public housing, making tertiary education and public transport free and heaps more. Yeah, and you mentioned that poor people spend more of their income on consumption. And a recent report released by the Anglicare Australia has found that poor people pay a poverty premium for pretty much everything. The Anglicare's research shows that people in poverty pay more for essential goods and services, including groceries, transport, uh, bills and phone credit. And this is due to the way that prices are structured. For example, it's cheaper in the long run to buy products in bulk, uh, but that's not possible if you don't have that much money or the ability to store all, all these products. Um, Another example from the report is that poor people are more likely to get an older, cheaper car, but those cars end up costing more money to run and use up petrol quicker. The report recommended raising welfare payments above the poverty line, making the minimum wage a livable wage, and scrapping the Stage 3 tax cuts, among other suggestions. It put it bluntly that the number one action we can take to lessen the impact of the poverty premium is lifting every Australian out of poverty. And while most people are struggling with the rising cost of living, Qantas announced it had made its largest profit in its history, $2.5 billion in one year. Soon after, CEO Alan Joy stepped down after scandals began to pile up, including misappropriating JobKeeper funds, illegally sacking thousands of workers and granting himself enormous pay rises. Despite all this, Treasurer Jim Chalmers has made it clear that Qantas will not have to pay back the $2.7 billion it received in public subsidies during the pandemic period. Labor MPs have called for the Qantas board to be sacked, but none have raised the call for Qantas to be renationalized. Greens MP Elizabeth Watson Brown pointed out the, that privatization has not improved the service or reduced costs. Qantas should be renationalized as part of a more integrated, climate friendly public transport system that is linked to the expansion of a national fast train network. A transparent and accountable board of workers could run the airline in the public's interests, and the workers would receive fair pay and conditions and more control over their workplace. There was a lively discussion at the September 5 public meeting on the Palestine catastrophe with participants and speakers agreeing that Labor needs to step up its support for Palestine. The meeting attracted about 400 attendees in person and online and heard from former Labor Foreign Minister and New South Wales Premier Bob Carr, former Human Rights Watch researcher and ABC journalist Sophie McNeil, and Palestinian-Australian lawyer and executive director of the Australian Centre for International Justice and executive director of the Australian Centre for International Justice, Rowan Araf. Carr spoke about the occupation of Palestine, settlement and apartheid, 
And McNeil said that Israeli forces have killed more Palestinians in the West Bank this year than ever before, including children. Araf called on the Australian government to take a clear stand on Palestine and Israel. And speaking from the floor, Palestinian activist Khalid Ghanem asked Carr why Palestinian resistance groups are listed as terrorist organisations, while Zionist groups that have been accused of violent crimes against Palestinians are allowed to operate freely. And now let's hear what is happening around the world. The conservative military coup-linked parties were decisively defeated in Thailand's elections on May 14, but three months later, an undemocratic constitution designed by the military coup leaders has allowed these parties to get back into government. The conservative parties aligned with the Phoi Thai party, which sidelined the Move Forward party, which had won the most votes. Democracy activists are outraged, if not surprised, and Kanyanat Kalfagianis, who's a spokesperson for the Australian Alliance for Thai Democracy, told Green Left that she, along with others from the new generation of Thai democracy activists, feel disappointed and deeply betrayed by the installation of the new government. She said they feel betrayed by the Phoi Thai Party because during the election campaign, they assured us that they would not have any partnership with the military junta parties. But now they say that the situation forced them to abandon the Move Forward Party and join in hand in hand with the military junta parties. She said this is another time that Thai democracy has failed us. And you can watch the full interview with Kalfagianis online. Anthony Albanese visited the Philippines earlier this month to meet with the president, Ferdinand Marcus Jr. And in response, activists from the Partido Lakas Ng Masa and Samahang Progressivo Ng Kabatan organized a protest uh, outside the Australian embassy. Protesters held banners and led chants against war and the AUKUS deal. Speakers opposed the Philippines government's support for increasing militarization, including the AUKUS security arrangement. They also read out a solidarity message from the Sydney Anti-AUKUS Coalition. Australia is increasing its military ties with the Marcos Jr. regime by promising to have joint naval patrols with the Philippines Navy in the South China Sea. Protesters also denounced the U.S. troop presence in the Philippines. Luis Rubiales, the president of the Royal Spanish Football Federation, finally resigned on September 10 after being suspended by FIFA for kissing Spanish striker Jennifer Hermoso without her consent. Swinging another player around his shoulder, and grabbing his crotch in a display of macho triumphalism. While the campaign against sexism in women's sport has won a victory, the issue is continuing to shake up politics in the Spanish state. In the ongoing debate in the mainstream media, silence is an expression of support for Rubiales. Rubiales is claiming that he, not Hermoso, is the victim, and that 81 leading women players who have refused to play for Spain unless there's a radical shake-up of the soccer administration are refusing to accept the crumbs they've been offered so far. They're committed to fighting for a better culture and conditions in the sport. Before Canada's 2023 summer was even over, it had officially been declared the worst fire season on record with more than 8 million hectares burned so far. While these wildfires have deeply impacted many communities, they have most severely impacted Indigenous communities. Indigenous Services Canada reported that more than 21,000 people from 45 Indigenous communities have been forced from their homes so far this year. Indigenous people are more than 10 times more likely to die in a fire than non-Indigenous people. Indigenous communities are economically deprived on a mass scale when it comes to addressing major fire emergencies and are fighting for greater control over firefighting capabilities on their territories and resources to sustain them. The expansive and frequent character of wildfires and heat domes are manifestations of a deeper underlying crisis, the existential threat of capitalism caused climate change. Indigenous communities have been at the forefront of struggles against extractive capital and fossil fuel industries. 
You can read more about all of these stories we talked about today, as well as videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. Green Left has some great forums coming up in the coming weeks across the country. On September 23 at 2pm at the Borloo Activist Centre in Perth, long-term First Nations activist Megan Krakawa, who is the director of the National Suicide Prevention and Trauma Recovery Project, and Marion McKay, who is an Invasion Day March organiser and Noongar advocate, will be discussing the fight for First Nations rights beyond the referendum. Then on September 26th, at 6.30 in Nam, Greenleft is holding a forum on Albanese's labour sacrificing principles for power at the Resistance Centre and Bookshop on Swanston Street. The current confirmed speakers are Sue Bull, who is a unionist and member of Socialist Alliance, and myself. We will be discussing labour's continuation of coalition policies like the Stage 3 tax cuts, the AUKUS submarine deal, and its failures to address the cost of living, housing and climate crises. And if you've enjoyed the podcast, you can become a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month and donate to our 2023 fighting fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us out. Your support is really appreciated. And remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, threads and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening. Thank you.